Certainly. So hello everyone and welcome to our virtual event organized by the Holocaust Studies Program at Western Galilee College in Akko, Israel. Um, my name is Daniela Osatsky-Stern and I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces of friends and colleagues. This week, Israel commemorates the victims of the Holocaust in the National Holocaust Remembrance Day. There are a lot of events and ceremonies. In our gathering tonight, we are happy to host two young, bright scholars, one from Ukraine and one from the US slash UK, who devote themselves to the study of the Holocaust. And as in our previous events, all of you are coming from all parts of the world, which makes me think that this strange passing year has created, in fact, new avenues for us who are involved in Holocaust research to better know each other and exchange our knowledge and work. The title of today's session is New Avenues in Eastern European Holocaust Research. And here are some technical notes. We are recording the session, the session and we will upload it to the internet. And please keep your microphones on mute. If you have any questions for our panelists, please write them down on the chat. As always, I want to thank Dr. Boaz Cohen, head of the program, Dr. Ronnie Michel Arielli, Jan Bujlaf and Dr. Yaron Pasher from the organizing team. And our first speaker for today is Dr. Yuri Rachenko, who is the director of the Center for Inter-Ethnic Relations in Eastern Europe in Kharkiv, Ukraine. He earned his PhD in Holocaust Studies in the Kharkiv National University. His dissertation is entitled Nazi Genocide of Ukrainian Jews in the Military Administrated Area, 1941-43. He was a USAGMM fellow during which he worked on his project Ukrainian Hilfspolizei and the Holocaust in Ukraine. He was also a Kagan fellow and a researcher in residence at Pauline Museum and the Emanuel Rindelblum Jewish what Historical else? Institute in New York. He is the author of many books and articles, including on Babi Yar, the Holocaust in Kharkiv, Andrei Melnik and his movement, and Holocaust in Ukrainian, Russian, Belarusian borderlands. He also just, I think a few days ago, published a new article in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Perhaps you can tell us something about that as well. And today he will speak about the muting people. Today he will speak about Ustasha Melnikite cooperation in the genocide in the independent state of Croatia, 1941-45. Yuri, the floor is yours. You can unmute yourself and you are a co-host if you need to share screen. Okay, thank you so much, Daniela. Good evening, everybody. Good any you no know, time <laughs> where you're located now. I hope so. Uh, you are okay. Unfortunately, we cannot you know speak to each other in one and you know, some class or room, something like this. But I think I hope one day we will meet and we can speak. So um, I must to say about a little bit about my topic. Um, so last two, three, four years. 
I am right and I'm trying to research uh, activity of organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the leadership of Colonel Andriy Melnik and their activity during Second World War and also their activity, their participation in the Holocaust. And uh, one day, I think Daniel also mentions this uh, stuff today that it's sometimes it's interesting to compare some stuff, uh, some practices, some movements, some uh, activities, and so on. And I decided one day, why uh, not compare, you know, Ustasha in, in, in uh, Croatia, in Balkans, in ex Yugoslavia, and uh, own in Ukraine, and their activity also in both locations in Ukraine and so on. And I must open you, you know, some small secret uh, and few weeks, maybe later, it will be published article um, about this, my presentation, today's presentation. And you, you, you can read you know, more than I will tell today for you because of you know, um, time limitation, because I have, I think, 20, 25 minutes, no, no more. Um, so, uh, Regarding to presentation, in April of 1941, uh, Hitler and Mussolini turned part of occupied Yugoslavia into puppet independent state of Croatia, uh, so-called NDH, Nezavisna Država Hrvatska, independent Croatian state. The NDH was run by members of radical Croatian nationalist movement Ustasha, headed by Pohlavnik, leader of Führer and Tepavelic. In Yugoslavia, there was also Ukrainian population, which they call themselves, part of them calls themselves Ukrainians, part of them call themselves uh, Rusins, Abu Rusini. It's also a question of identity. Uh, but primarily, this territory came under control of and, and Deha, and this population also was part of population of uh, this state, new Ukraine, created state in 1941. The organization of Ukrainian nationalists, or UN, which included both Banderite and Melnikite wings sought to influence the Ukraine population in the territory of Ustashi's state. Both the Ustasha and the UN considered Jews to be their enemies. Uh, they disseminated anti Semitic propaganda and took part in, this, in the extermination of the Jews. While the Melnikites uh, are known to have on good terms and, uh, with the relations of the NDH, many aspects of this history and the, the relation that what uh, had yet to be reached and tried to, to read this stuff. So in my research, in my presentations today, I try to uh, answer, to say, uh, um, instantly all members who, who went to uh, um, took part in, in the Holocaust. And also they, uh, uh, you know that in 1939 also um, was created pro-Hitlerite uh, Slovakian state. And it's interesting uh, that uh, own M activists were quite critical to this uh, Hitler's activity and so on, but they uh, uh, supported uh, creation of NDH. So I try to say, what was activity of OUNM in NDH during 1941, 1944? I tried to describe their uh, involvement in the Holocaust. I tried to describe also um, relations of leaders and some so-called small people, ordinary men, ordinary people, uh, both in Ustasha and so on, uh, and like this. But you know that several zones of control on Gorans were established uh, in Nazi and Axis occupied Yugoslavia. Hitler and Mussolini allowed to the inclusion of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the independent state of Croatia and established on uh, April 10th, 1941. At the same time, Ustasha was forced to cede part of Dalmatia to fascist Italy. Uh, the first law adopted by NDH were anti Semitic and uh, anti Serb in nature. Um, for instance, as early as uh, 30 April, Croatia passed uh, the law, uh, it was called on Croatian citizenship, which stated that it's a quote, Jews and Serbs are, and Serbs are not citizens of independent state of Croatia, also they may reside in the state, end of quote. Uh, it was emphasized by the uh, political rights to uh, are to be enjoyed only by Aryans. No, it's a question who were Aryans for uh, for uh, Ustasha. It's mostly a, a, a 
Croats, ethnical Croats, uh, Bosnian Muslims, and uh, any any another population, non non Jewish and non uh, let's say Serbian. Yeah. Interior Minister uh, Andrei Artukovic declared that he would, it's a quote, quote uh, question, uh, it's a quote, sorry, that he would solve the question, Jewish question, the same way as in Germany, end of quote. The Jews were forced to wear armbands with the letter Z, they, uh, the Jida, Yehudi, uh, Jew, uh, and they were prohibited from participation in social, cultural, and political life in the NDH. And this time, the policy of the persecution of, uh, of the Orthodox Serbs, some of whom were forcibly converted to Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, also uh, commenced. In other hand, the Ustasha considered Bosnian Muslims as a part of uh, Croatian people, is because for some political reasons as well. Uh, that you know that it was created uh, Yasinova's concentration camp. A lot of people were victims and Jewish and Serb Serbian and some non-political loyal uh, Croats and uh, let's say anti-fascist uh, Croats and uh, Bosnian Muslims. In total, uh, 26,000 Jewish residents of Endeha uh, were exterminated. 19,000 in and the hard camps like Yasinovats and 7,000 deported and killed in German controlled uh, occupied Poland. About uh, 334,000 Serbs, 90,000 Roma and 2,000 uh, Croats and Bosnian Muslims also was killed by uh, Ustasha in 1941, 1945 years. Uh, some part of Ukrainians also were killed in Yansinovats, uh, but not because their uh, identity, let's say, uh, just because, no, not just, but because um, partisan activity not far from their villages in 1944, when it was end of the war, and uh, uh, this so-called anti-partisan krieg, anti-partisan war in Yugoslavia uh, became very uh, brutal. Uh, let's say a few words about cooperation of um, before the war and the creation and Ukrainian right right, right uh, wing radicals gained experience to join struggle in the pre-war period. The own uh, before the split of this organization to ban the rights and many guys own and Ustasha was established in 1929 had always been good in good terms, good relations. As the own ideologist, for instance, uh, the own ideologist Mikhail Kolodzinsky were detained uh, to be the leadership of own uh, Ukrainian nationalists, leadership of Ukrainian nationalists, so called Provid Pun, P U N, Provid uh, Ukrainian nationalists, leadership uh, uh, to Ustasha camp in Italy in 1933. 1933. And then Kolodzinsky worked uh, on uh, foregoing ties between Ukrainian and Croatian radicals, and even became friendly with Ante Pavelic, with leader of uh, Ustasha. After Germans forced entry at Zagreb and independent state of Croatia was established on April 12, 1941, Wojtanivski, Wojtanivski, um, Vasil was it was leader of own uh, M in 1941 in, in Croatia. Uh, uh, Vasily Wojtanivski, uh, um, uh, published uh, an ardently pro ustasha statement in the newspaper uh, Hrvatsky Novosti, Croatian News, and this also um, stuff, these articles were published in Ukrainian uh, papers, newspapers. The appeal which, uh, this, this appeal with uh, Wotanivsky signed as the, it's a, uh, the quote, the all, uh, the Plenty penitentiary of the organization of, of Ukrainian nationalists uh, declared that own M not only supported the formation on, of, of NDH, this is Nzavisna Dershava Kharvatska, but also politically allied with Ustasha regime. It's a quote uh, the old dream of fraternal and amicable Croatian people has come to pass. The hegemon, hegemony of Serbian oppressions has broken. Croatia has risen. End of quote. Um, it also published uh, a lot of such appeals, political appeals of Ukrainian pro-OM students in different 
uh, papers. One of them was um, quite uh, quite quite well known, well known, well known. Sorry, in 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 um, um, in uh, all Western and Central Europe, well known. And this sort of quote, such like many uh, long life Croatian state within the historical borders. It's a question. Was the historical borders long life the Pohlavnik of the uh, Croatian state, Dr. Ante Pavelic, long life deputy Pohlavnik general Slavko Kvaternik, and so on and so on. Uh, Melnik, leader of Owen M, sends a uh, congratulatory telegram to Pavelic on April 40, 1941, but it was only on July uh, 7, 1941, that he received a brief reply alluding to uh, prospect of the quote of friendly Croatian uh, Ukrainian relationship development in the future end of quote and the Pohlamic likely had little interest in Ukrainian project uh, pro prior the uh, German attack attack of USSR on June 22nd 1941. Um, I will cut a little bit that Banderites sent uh, letters and also on, on summer 1941 after proclamation of uh, Ukrainian independent state so-called in Lviv. Uh, but uh, actually uh, leader of Ustasha was quite cold to them and he accepted this you know, telegrams and this uh, embassy, but it was, it was uh, like you say, not, not to worry, didn't play a very big role. After formation of um, independent state of Ukraine, uh, Melnik officially appointed Wojtanivsky, about mentioned Wojtanivsky, and Voj to Pavelic. As the Melnik had established the Ukrainian re representative office, uh, Ukrainske Predstavnictvo, UP, I will call it UP, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, UP, uh, also headed by Wojtanivsky. In post-war memories, Yevhen uh, Matsyak, another OUNM leader uh, in and the Ha, one of his uh, his memories that he, is, he described that the main purposes of this UP uh, was the first, uh, uh, forward legal and consular protection of Ukrainians, the first one, second one, provide the self-defense of Ukrainian settlements in Bosnia, partial, uh, partially in Slavonia. The third one is develop a plan for cultural and autonomy of Ukrainians in Bosnia, Slavonia, and Srijem. Uh, render assistance of Ukrainian in the territory of former Yugoslavia that was entirely occupied by the German military administration because you remember that part of Yugoslavia was occupied also by, by Italy, part of uh, Hungary and so on. So it was uh, quite interesting zone of different zones of, of different policies in these zones. And the uh, fifth uh, punct is uh, implement an information and propaganda campaign to advance uh, the Ukraine calls. No, Ukraine calls its means, of course, own M calls, not you. It's, uh, you. You must understand the difference. Uh, it's the personal nature of the Pohlavnik relationship with own M may be seen in the conduct of the meeting with own with Ukrainian Melnikai delegation on August uh, 12, 1941. Uh, 41, uh, 41. I can try to show you. Uh, I'll try to show you know, one photo, I hope, so I can do it. So just a quick moment. Riga, riga, example. Oh, Akshav. Can you see this stuff, what I am doing now? Yes. This, yes, is, this is picture, yes. So it's, yes, you can see, yeah? Okay. So it's official uh, newspaper in um, Independent State of Croatia, it's uh, called Novi List, and this newspaper it's, uh, describes a visit of uh, Wojtanivski, his delegation, the Wojtanivski delegation to um, visiting um, uh, leaders of, to leader of uh, NDH, Ante Pavelic, and here you can see a couple pictures. I will leave this picture for you and Let's see. Um, it's during this visit. You can see here this guy is Ante Pavelic, and this guy in glasses is Wojtanivsky. And this is Ustasha uh, uh, Gwarton Tone and Gwarton. So, about this meeting, about this uh, 
visit of these delegations. Uh, in attendance were totally and so, uh, 30 representatives headed by Wotanevsky, which uh, was escorted to, by two Ukrainian officers, it's a quote, dressed in, uh, dressed in traditional uniform of UGA, Ukrainian Galician Army. As the officers uh, were known the symbols of own M and Ukrainian symbols, the delegation was greeted by Pavel Ustasha Gvard. The Pahlanik themselves received the, the visitors and the Matya. Uh, recorded in his uh, war uh, post meeting notes that Pavage paid a lot of respect to Yuhem Konovalets. Uh, sorry, it's, I have some, some, some sound. It's not, not from my side. Okay. Uh, if it doesn't disturb you, I will continue. Okay. Um, and interesting that uh, during this, uh, and he paid, he, he, he honored, uh, he, uh, he honored also the pre-war leader of Oun, um, Oun uh, United Organization, Ivan Konovalets. At the beginning of the meeting, Matya convoyed a greeting uh, from Melnik and also spoke in context of German uh, Germans' war on the USSR that how it's called Ukrainian Cossacks and Croatian Knights had uh, a shared tradition uh, of struggle against Asiatic nomads. Um, Matsya also thanked Pavelich for allowing the formation of Ukrainian Legion after the other called UL, UL, Ukrainian Legion, and presented him a gift, <laughs> a Ukrainian saber or an of sword, Echomrim the Banglit and the Zaher, saber sword. I have a picture of this um, also. this. Uh, you see, Ukrainians predayu dar po hlavniku, kozatsku sablu. It's Ukrainians, you know, give and all this gift to 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 pohlavnik kozak sword. Um, and the interesting that it was mentioned, this is a sword of uh, this is saber of from the time of Bogdan Khmelnytsky time uh, period. It's, it's 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 a question also for me, but is it true or not? But <laughs> it's quite also interesting. Um, how many minutes do I have? Ten minutes? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, and it, it also must be mentioned that um, upon uh, part in Pavelic raising his hand in fascist salute, you know, this typical, yeah, even used the own party slogan. He said, Slava Ukraini, and uh, all these uh, guys from Aoun M told, uh, no, glory to Ukraine, Slava Ukraini. And all these guys uh, uh, responded to him, glory to leader, Slava Vazhdevi. It's the slogan um, of Melnik, Melnik uh, fraction uh, so of, of OUM. Um, and this also uh, visit was described in, uh, not, not only as you see in uh, Ukrainian press, also in uh, press of Ustasha. And so on, and um, it must be said that uh, during this time, this Ukrainian UP, uh, they get even a um, Jewish house. Uh, so uh, Ustasha uh, government offered them Jewish house, and these Jews, according to member of this man, uh, Matsyak, escaped to one place. But it's a question: okay. did they really escape, or were they killed uh, in, in somewhere from this? And and yes, you know what's on another terrible places. Uh, the Manikites had completed the freedom of organized commemorative and cultural events in the independent state of Croatia. They organized a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, the political uh, uh, no actions, commemorations, different political actions, different political meetings, and so on and so on. And interesting that uh, Manik and uh, Pavelic, they uh, shared to each other letters. And, uh, and 19, in 1941, in 1942, and in 1943, 1944, until arrest of Melnik in uh, January 1944. And uh, it's interesting that uh, Melnik in 1941, 1942 wrote a lot of letters and to Hitler, to Himmler, to another fascist leaders of Eastern Europe and Central Europe and Western Europe, to, to Spain, Spanish, for instance, embassy, um, ambassador in, in, in Deutschland, in Germany, in, in Berlin, and so on. But interesting that uh, only these letters uh, to, to between 
these two fascist leaders between Menik and between Pavelic were you know, very warm, let's say, very personal. You know, it was not 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 in general stuff. Let's say we we are and so on and so on. But it was quite uh, quite quite understandable that um, Pavelic anyway supported even when Germans began a persecution repression of own M in uh, occupied Ukraine in the Rice Commissariat of Ukraine. It was understandable to see that. Uh, they still were, I know how to say, friends and aliens, and so on. Uh, Pavelic and the Ustasha in general had hoped to, to win over all national minorities in Indiha, and uh, they tried to cooperate with non-Serbian and non-Jewish population, uh, for instance, with uh, Bosnian Muslims. This policy also included uh, creation of different legions, uh, so-called poli political um, of creation of legions, they created a few uh, Bosnian uh, military formations, for instance, uh, Ibrahima, Harda, uh, uh, another one, it was Hussein, Huska, Miklovic, Harda, and so on and so on, few few detachments. One of them was so-called Ukrainian legion, which was created in 1942. Most part of these uh, uh, members of this, of this uh, detachment were local Ukrainians and Drusans. And also a little bit wide Guardist emigrants who stayed in 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 uh, in the in 1941, 1942, 1943, and that they helped to come to Ukraine with this legion. But this idea was felt out because the German didn't allow to to send this legion to Ukraine, and this was sent to fight against uh, uh, partisans, against partisans, Chetnik partisans. Uh, let's say of, Dra of Drago Mikhailovich and also against the Red Communist Partisans by Tito and so on. And uh, in, uh, I just, I, I will not read all this stuff, And uh, but uh, in post-war memory, some members of this uh, organization or an M act activist in, uh, in the Ha, they had to conf confess that they fought not only against communists, like majority tried to show, but also killed uh, civil population and also the Ukrainian legion, I, I mean, uh, members, and also uh, fought against Chetniks. But Chetniks, you know, we were not communists, they were even, let's say, <laughs> anti communists and so on. And uh, Matzak in his post war memories, he said that uh, now it came to Sodom and Homora, that it was the terrible uh, anti partisan so called war, and uh, it became. Uh, Terrible situations that they must confess that during these actions, also uh, some Jews were killed because a lot of Jews tried to join partisan movement, uh, mostly communist partisan movement in Yugoslavia, and uh, a lot of them were killed during these uh, wars, during these war clashes. Uh, I have, I think, three minutes, yes, or something like this. Uh, two, two, three minutes. Two minutes, okay. Um, I must tell that uh, during this time, uh, one uh, important stuff must be mentioned that uh, in their press and these newspapers in uh, newspaper Nastup own uh, M public uh, public public sites. <laughs> A lot of pro uh, Ustasha articles in 1941-1944, and uh, a lot of these uh, articles were uh, with anti-Semitic propaganda. That, uh, for instance, about one was about arre um, arrest in 1943 of uh, Pavelic and the. It's a quote, Freemasons, international jury, capital, uh, royal families, and the po police of the whole world attacked anti Pavelich in his fight for uh, months. Uh, this, in, in 1943, it's uh, after in, um, Marcel was killed, uh, King Alexander Karagiorgievich. Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia. So, so a, lot of, a lot of, I will not uh, quote you all of this. I will come into conclusion. What a lot of such anti Semitic uh, activities, it's a lot of anti Semitic uh, articles during this period. Uh, to conclude, the Ustasha and the OUN, uh, later the OUN M, were uh, from 1930s to 1945 not just parties with similar, similar ideology and political goals and ideals, but also the 
sinuous and the most uh, unimated of partners in political struggle. The political uh, relate, relates facing the own M and Ustasha, especially similar, similar prior uh, April 10, 1941, when the support of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, the independent state of Croatia and the Ha was established. For many kites, uh, the newly formed Ustashi state was uh, exemplary uh, representing the hope that the Germans would follow uh, the similar path in the territory of Ukraine and allow them to, to organize a puppet fascist government in Ukraine and uh, one headed by Colonel Andrew Manning. But I won't am leaders miscalculated. Uh, the Nazis saw Ukrainian uh, exclusive a territory of to be colonized. Uh, in their publication on the territory of uh, and the Ha, own amateurs prize the own Ustasha, their leaders and policies uh, uh, of and the Ha, including the persecution and murder of the Jews. Own M propagandists in the, in the Ha in 1941 and 45 prepared uh, this cemented a considerable amount of anti Semitic literature and portrayed Jews as the old enemy of the Ukrainians and Croats. Mannequins took part in the accusation and possibly even in confiscation of Jewish-owned property in the Endeha. It cannot be ruled out of own activity serving in uh, UL or other formation of, of Ustashist uh, Croatia. It's a question about police and about different uh, militias, about different guards and so on and so on. It's, UL is just an, some piece of this system. Uh, we're also involved in the persecution, plunder and uh, murder, murder of Jews. Given their lives, the German support in the Manica's political bankruptcy in Ukraine was already cleared in spring 1941. But anyway, until uh, it's the last sentence, uh, until end of existence of and the Ha, even when Germans arrested leaders of OM and uh, persecuted them and so on. Ustasha supported this movement in the territory of uh, their controlled territory. Thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri, for a very interesting presentation. I'm sure many of us will have questions, so please write them down on the chat. Our next speaker is Dr. Whiteman Bern who is a senior lecturer in history at North Umbria University in Newcastle, UK. He was uh, previously the executive director of the Virginia Holocaust Museum. He received his PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he worked under the direction of Professor Christopher Browning, who is here with us today. Dr. Bern had written many articles and books. His first book, Marching into Darkness, which received several prizes, examines the complicity of the German army in the Holocaust in Belarus. He is currently working on a book project on the Yanovska camp in Lviv. He also serves as a consultant to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And no less important, he is also a combat veteran of Iraq. Today, he will speak about connecting the dots the Yanovska concentration camp as a social network. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Daniela. Um, and I really appreciated um, you calling me a younger historian earlier. That was very nice. Um, I have to say, as uh, I literally, uh, for the first time today in my life, I had to get reading glasses, so I don't feel particularly young. Um, but thanks so much. Um, and uh, I'm really appreciative for everyone that's here uh, it's kind of like a, a virtual reunion, um, which is really great. Uh, so let me go ahead and put up um, my slides here. Let's see. All right, hopefully this is working. And if it's not, um, hopefully someone will tell me. Um, okay, we can see. Great, uh, and so, yeah, so as, as Daniela mentioned, 
um, this this presentation is building off of of the Anofska book, which is complete in manuscript form. Um, and so I, I hope that um, this will spur some great questions. I can talk forever about the camp, but I want to kind of focus on um, something slightly different, but also that forms part of it. Um, so I'm gonna share just a very short piece, and then um, I'm gonna have a much more uh, sort of interactive discussion. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start that, and put my glasses on so I can read. Um, when Adolf Kolonko arrived in Inovska at the head of a group of Travniki men, on 27 January, 1942, he carried with him a surprising collection of prior experiences and relationships in that strange fraternity of Holocaust perpetrators. An ethnic German born in 1923 in Upper Silesia in what is now Ratchiborch, Poland, Adolf joined the SS in 1933 and in, in August 1939 was called to Berlin. Um, that, birth date is clearly wrong because he didn't join the SS when he was 10. Um, in an exemplary uh, Bauhaus complex in the Bernau suburbs, he attended a two-week course of military training at the SD school there. While it is not clear precisely what his training entailed, the SD school at Bernau could count as its graduates the leaders of the Einsatzgruppen killing squads shortly before Kalanko's arrival and Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon. While multiple courses for a variety of officials were offered, the whole place served as a pedagogical initiation into the Nazi war against the Jews. Many murderers of Jews passed through its doors as instructor or student. Among those there that August was Josef Grzimek. Grzimek was the son of a slaughterhouse worker who grew up only 20 miles away from Kalanko in Silesia. His training prepared him for the false flag attacks on Polish sites that provided the pretext for the start of World War II. Grzimek would go on to command multiple concentration camps in District Galician, including the Lviv ghetto remnant known as the Yulav. He would later march survivors from the Brazhov camp to Auschwitz. Kolonko left Berlin for Czestochowa, Poland, where he served as a paramilitary. In the home of the Black Madonna Shrine, he overlapped with two future Yunovska men, Paul Fox, and Hans Sabota. Leaving Czestochowa, Kolonko headed for the city of Rodom. There, he guarded the SS and police leader, the man who established the Rodom ghetto and who would go on to create the Lviv ghetto as the future higher SS and police leader in Lviv, an SS general by the name of Friedrich Katzmann. Before training Volksdeutsche, Volksdeutsche paramilitaries in Lublin in late, early, in late 1940, Kolonko helped establish a slave labor camp at Biawa Podowska, along with four other future Yunovska SS men. His next major assignment saw him, saw him stationed at the Travniki camp as a trainer. Kolonko then arrived in Lviv with new guards for Yunovska from that camp. Once in Yunovska, he, acquainted, he reunited with an acquaintance from his pre-war job in a Siemens factory a man named Roman Schoenbach, another notorious uh, Yanovska guard. Kolonko would graduate from his supervisor duty in Yanovska to command his own camp in Grodek Jagielonski before returning there after his own command's liquidation. So a close examination of the Yanovska camp and its perpetrators reveals that a surprising number of these SS men also walked similar paths and encountered future colleagues as Kolonko did were able to retrace his footsteps so well because he survived the war and was tried for his crimes. Now, there may be many more connections that have been lost uh, to the vagaries of time and war. But what I wanna talk about today really is two things. Um, the first thing I wanna do is talk about social networks uh, as a mode of analysis and as a way of thinking about um, the Holocaust and in particular thinking about Holocaust perpetrators. And so in some ways, this discussion is um, a bit of a proof of concept in that sense, thinking about, you know, and hopefully inspiring others to try to try this approach, because it's, it's been something that I think has been really eye opening uh, to me. And so I'm going to talk for the first part of my discussion about really what it is that we're doing here. What is a social network? What is a social network analysis? 
And, and what might that be able to tell us about the Holocaust? And then I, I, I do want to cover in the second half um, what I think my analysis of the Anofska camp perpetrators tells us um, and what it suggests um, about this particular group of people, because I think, I think there's something very interesting going on here. Um, okay, and so, you know, I, I have on this slide, and hope you've had a chance to read it already, some really interesting quotes um, about social networks that I think really sort of run the gamut from an earlier time in the 70s all the way to present. Um, one thing I want to point out um, that, that you may not be aware of is that the Milgram experiment that um, Barab Asi is talking about here is actually not the one that we're most familiar with. Um, one, of the, one of Milgram's actual experiments was a social network experiment where he essentially wanted to see um, about degrees of separation and he asked um, a few people to send letters and then try to send letters on to other groups of people in order to determine sort of how a social network is built, which I thought was a really interesting discovery. So let's talk um, for a little bit about what, what a social network is. Um, a really famous uh, German sociologist whose name now escapes me, um, 150 years ago said, uh, tell me who you deal with and I will tell you who you are. And, and that's really in its, at its base level what a social network is. It's simply a group of a collection of entities and interactions, that's it. Um, and it's not, a, it, it's not something that is in any way re limited to you know, Facebook or Twitter or the, the kinds of social networks that we think about today. Um, in fact, you can really build one of these um, with anything, right? Um, and I, I'll show you some examples of that. Um, just to give you a really quick uh, and down and dirty rundown of some of the terminology that we use. Um, I'll, I'll use this image here, which comes from a social network diagram that I'll, uh, I'll show later in more detail. But really, all you need to know are, are three terms, nodes, edges, and weights. Um, and a node is simply an entity in the network. Um, this can be a person, it can be a place, it can be a letter, uh, it could be any, anything that, that is connected to something else, right? Um, messages, books, publishers, anything that can have a relational um, connection to something else. So in this particular image, um, there are only two kinds of nodes, uh, people and places, right? Um, the second term here that's important is edges. And the edge is simply the line. And what, what an edge really is and the, the understanding of a social network is what is the connection between these entities, right? Um, and you can have multiple different kinds of connections. And, and what I've built here is actually quite a simple social network um, because the connection really is simply, you know, served at or was located in, right? Um, but these um, edges can be all kinds of different things. So it could be sends an email to, uh, it can be is related to, is in a relationship with, um, you know, published by, uh, stationed in, killed by, whatever. You can have any kind of, any number of relationships between two nodes or entities in the social network. Um, and the last element, which is one that I, I can talk about a little bit as we move forward, and is not one that I'm as, as concerned about in the network that I've built, is the weight. Um, and that's usually represented in the thickness of the edge, in the thickness of that line. And this simply indicates the strength of that relationship. Um, and this can be determined in a variety of different ways. Um, it can be frequency, right? Um, so for example, here you see Kalanko has a particularly heavy weight with uh, the Anoska camp because he goes back and forth several times uh, between the camp. Um, it can also be qualitative. Right, so if you're doing a, a social network of the people that you know in your life, um, you may create a numerical value for the strength of that relationship, um, where the higher number is a stronger relationship. So, you know, your spouse might be a stronger relationship than you know uh, the custodian that works at your place of business, but you know both of them. You have a relationship with both of them. Um, this is something that also, and I don't want to get too technical because that would also get me in a certain level out of my depth. Um, but this can also be generated um, through a variety of algorithms 
um, by various software programs as well to determine, you know, sort of who is most important or what what connections are most important. Um, so what can these tell us? What's the point um, beyond sort of creating these, you know, really snazzy um, diagrams, right? Well, one of the things that a social network analysis and, and doing the work of breaking down these connections and these interactions can do, I think that's really important is show us the reality of organizations. Um, we always have sort of what the ideal is or what the sort of setup or, or structure is that's portrayed to the world. Um, but social networks can, I think, really tell us how the world really works. Um, and whether that be in an organization or in something much larger, like an, an historical event like the Holocaust. Um, and so that's something that I'm hoping that uh, my network analysis here does a little bit. So give me an example. Um, and this is a, a, a fictional um, breakdown of a company. Uh, I guess it, it's an, a, some kind of petroleum exploration company. And you see on the left here, sort of the, the org chart, the organizational chart of what this company looks like in terms of who's in charge um, and, and who's in charge of whom and what the management sort of uh, framework looks like, right? Um, but what if we were, for example, to, to uh, compile the interactions, for example, who's sending emails back and forth? Um, who's phone calling who, right? Who is meeting with whom, right? And what if when we create that, we add those, that element of data into the social network, we get this document or this image on the right. And what you see here is that the people that you might think are most important may not actually be that most important as that important to the running of the company, right? So you see, for example, this person Cole, whoever that is, who is way down on the chart on the left, you know, into several different subsections, sub departments of the, of the organization seems to however, be at the center of these interactions. Uh, you know, what might that say about this person, right? Whereas you notice the senior vice president, Jones here, is really only connected in, in a couple of different ways to the, to the network. Um, and so one of the things that, that social networks do that I think is really important um, and is also really useful to what I do and what I think all of us do here is it, it offers us patterns that we may not have noticed or be unable to see earlier that then ask us questions. Um, you know, why is it that this coal person is so important? Because we never would have thought that this person was important by looking at the, the sort of way things are supposed to be on the left here. Um, but once we sort of do this work of, of connections, uh, it, it lays out patterns that at a minimum raise questions for us. And sometimes they raise more questions than they might answer. Um, and I think you might see that as, as I move on to talk a little bit about Yanofska because I don't have all the answers uh, but what I do have are lots of really interesting questions that I would never have thought to think about or ask had I not uh, sort of embarked on, on this work. And this work is something that hasn't really been done uh, with Holocaust perpetrators, which is quite surprising, I think. Um, but it, it's just work that, that hasn't been done yet. Um, I, will, I will share a quote that I think is really interesting um, that comes from a a kind of a social network that was done on Rwandan uh, perpetrators. And, and this, this scholar wrote that, quote, the trust generated through repeated interactions between networked individuals facilitates collective action, end quote. And that's something that I want to explore um, moving forward, right? Is, and what I want to suggest is at a minimum that the relationships between the Anofska SS men that pre-existed, that predated their time in the camp and post-dated their time in the camp, at a minimum were really important in facilitating the Holocaust in Galicia, in District Galicia and in, and in, in you know, Eastern Poland, Western Ukraine, right? That portion of the general government uh, that I'm talking about. Okay. So what I wanna do now with the rest of my discussion is give you uh, a sort of rundown of how I went about this for the Inoska camp and some findings. Okay, so I'm going to try. I'm going to try to give you a very brief history of this this entity, this place that I've written a whole book on, um, which is a little bit difficult. Um, I, I, I like to say that the Inovska camp is probably the most important concentration camp that you've never heard of, though I'm sure that this group of people um, probably has heard of it. 
um, but certainly the public hasn't. The campus established in 1941 um, in Lviv. So it's, it's interesting in that it's a, an urban camp and you can see here the location of it um, just very much on the outskirts in the suburbs of the city of Lviv. If you go there today, uh, it's about a 20 minute walk from the city center. So it's, it's very much a, a centrally located camp. Um, it's established initially as a branch of the Deutsche Ausrüstungswerke, so the German Equipment Factory, which is a, uh, a subsidiary sort of corporation of uh, the SS um, under Globochnik initially. And it's, it's uh, created by a guy named Gebauer. And uh, Gebauer's second in command is a guy named Gustav Wilhaus. And here you have a, a wonderful image of Wilhaus and his daughter and his wife um, in the camp. And Wilhaus is, is, is the deputy commander of the DAW, the Deutsche Ausrüstungswerke. But immediately he and Katzmann, the higher SS and police leader um, of, uh, of District Galician, or of Lviv rather. And it's really interesting because this lieutenant and this general have this relationship, which is it's really odd. Um, but without going into a great deal of, of, of detail, um, Wilhaus basically politics to get his own camp. And so eventually he gets, uh, his, he gets to create his own camp, which is known as the ZAL, the Zwangsarbeitslager uh, Janowska. And I'll sort of use in this presentation Janowska as a shorthand for that particular camp. And if you look at the satellite, or the, I always say satellite, if you look at the aerial photograph on the left, which was taken uh, by the Luftwaffe while the camp was still marginally in operation, in 1944, uh, you'll see that uh, there's sort of this northern section with the, with the L-shaped barracks. That's the, you know, that's the, the Zwangsarbeitslager, that's um, Gebauer's section, or excuse me, that's Wilhaus's section. And then um, the southern portion there is the DAW. And then off to the, uh, to the right side of your screen, you'll see uh, what's left of the Jewish cemetery. So literally right next door to the camp is the Jewish cemetery. So why is Zinovska important? Um, what I think is really important and unique about it is that it's a hybrid camp that fulfills three functions simultaneously. It's a, it's a, a slave labor camp, not only for the city of Lviv, um, but also for the, the Durschkanstrasse 4, the, the highway that Himmler wants to build through Ukraine. It's also a transit camp uh, for District Galician. So many, uh, many, if not most of the 500,000 or so Jews that are murdered in District Galician pass through this camp at some point, if it's only to stop at the spur station, uh, which is nearby. And then lastly, and this is something that, that I found that I think is, is really fascinating, is that perhaps as many as 80,000 Jews were murdered on site uh, by shooting and in the ravines behind the camp. And you can see them uh, in the hills here in the north of the camp. And that number, if it's around, if it, if it approaches 80,000, which is not a an astronomical number, it's one that, that Thomas Sonkuler has put forward. That would mean that Yanovska camp was responsible for the deaths of more Jews than Majdanek, uh, more Jews than Dachau, more Jews than Belzen, and more Jews in Birken, Buchenwald, as well as more Jews in Mauthausen, which is kind of a, an extraordinary uh, revelation that, that I think a lot of people aren't familiar with. Okay, I could talk about Yanovska for another hour and a half, but I'm not going to do that. I wanna talk a little bit about the network and about the perpetrators. So how did I do this? Um, one of the things that's really important to realize is that you don't need to be a, a coder. You don't need to be sort of a, a, a tech whiz to do this. Uh, essentially what I did was compile a list of data um, about these perpetrators from a variety of sources, um, from perpetrator documents, from survivor testimonies, from oral histories, uh, from all kinds of different things. And I simply put them into a large database. And it's okay if you can't read all the, the information there, it's really just there to, to impress you with how much information actually is there. Um, and all you have to do is really tie an individual to a location. Um, and I can talk about the ambiguity of this because all the, the dates are not precise, um, but I am able to tie these individuals to specific locations with varying degrees of uh, accuracy regarding the time. And so the, the data that I was able to capture from the document is around 78 unique perpetrators who at one point in time were in the camp. And that led to over 400 identifiable geographic locations. And this is from uh, birth until really death. So this also includes post-war 
um, locations, trial locations, uh, places of captivity after the war, um, though I'm not going to talk about that as much um, in this particular discussion. And if you do this sort of in an analog version, you get something like this, uh, where yellow is locations. And this, is what, this was just me trying to begin to parse out who might have been in the same places, potentially at the same time. A little more specific, you get something like this, which shows us um, alphabetically by perpetrator the various places um, that they were. And then if I put all of this into um, Gephi, which is the, the network program that I used, again, it's not a difficult program, you get something like this, which shows you by location as well as by function uh, what people are doing when. And so a particular interest might be that, um, that blue cluster at the top of the screen, which is members of the Sonder Commando 1005, which is another element of the camp that I can talk about. And just to give you a sort of sense of what this looks like in real time, if you're using the software, you can sort of hover over a particular node and it'll highlight who is connected to that node. So here we're looking at um, places. So Dachau, for example, who's connected to Dachau, what perpetrators have a connection there. Here's Grzimek and the place where he was connected, uh, which is a nice way of sort of highlighting for us where people happen to be when. Okay, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time here. So let me talk about some of the findings um, that, I, that, that have presented themselves through this work. One of them is, is an interesting finding in general of backgrounds. So by mapping just the locations of birth, for the Yanovsk SS men, one of the things that becomes really clear is that there are two clusters of folks who might be considered to be sort of outliers if we're thinking about the SS and camp guards in particular. And they are basically Hungarian slash Yugoslav ethnic Germans and ethnic Germans from uh, Silesia and, uh, and sort of what would now be Poland, uh, but sort of East East Prussia and Silesia. And this is a really interesting group. Um, and you see some of the folks here that I have images of, um, but you can tell just by the, the scattering of the points that a lot of the key perpetrators in the camp are ethnic German SS men, um, which has its own sort of interesting connections, right? And so one of them here is, is uh, Peter Bloom, who comes from a, a group in the Banat. So sort of uh, Serbian, Yugoslavian, ethnic Germans. Uh, more generally, um, that, yeah, but, it's okay. We generally have to submit a syllabus with it. And then uh, a syllabus. Sorry about that. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is that um, many of these men have in common a place called Debicha, which was where they ended up after they were initially inducted into the Waffen SS. Um, and there are several people up to 15 of these Hungarian and Yugoslavian ethnic Germans who went through Dabicha and then ended up in Yanovska. And of course, one of the things that's quite interesting um, to be parsed out is uh, that many of these men claim to have been forced into the Waffen SS um, as ethnic Germans, um, but this is always problematic, right? And I think, I think disputed in many ways. Um, but these men stuck together, many of them. And, and you can look, if you look at where some of these birthplaces are, you know, they're, they're neighbors, uh, you know, and, and I can't prove it, um, but you know, what are the chances that a lot of these people knew each other? You know, how close, how, how separate, in other words, could an ethnic German population be uh, when they're that close together in the neighboring village or neighboring town, right? So that many of these men, and certainly Kalanko and Schoenbach, because they worked in the same factory, um, you know, they, they knew each other very much so before the war. So background is one area of sort of network uh, or, or connections, right? Um, the second is, is training. Um, and you saw this in, in the larger network diagram. Um, the Travniki connection is, is the most direct um, where you have, you know, straight, straight up groups of Travniki men who are uh, pass through Travniki and go directly to Yanovska. Um, we also have Durlevanger men from the Durlevanger Brigade who initially provide the staff for the camp. Um, but what's interesting here is that you also have the trainers. So um, Kolonko, I mentioned earlier, was a trainer there. And he goes with his group of Askaris, 17 of them, to Yanovska. 
It's interesting, Kalanko in his testimony after the war describes these Travniki men that he took with him to Yanovska as being trigger happy in his words, which is kind of interesting considering that he's the one that trained them. Um, and of course that we know that at, at Travniki, one of the sort of graduating exercises was to murder Jews. Um, there's another connection there as well, which is that of R Richard Rokita, who is pictured here, who was um, the deputy commandant for a while um, of the uh, Yanovska camp, but also served as a trainer at Travniki. Um, another place that we might think about training um, is in the Selbstschutz uh, experience. So lots of these guys have uh, experience in common in the Selbstschutz across um, occupied Poland um, and then eventually into, into Ukraine. So we talk about you know, prior assignments as well as camp and ghetto service, we have an even greater um, connection. Uh, many of eight men, eight of the Inovsk SS men had prior experience in the Selbstschutz in Lublin. And we all sort of know what, what that entailed, right? This, is, this takes place before uh, they get to the camp. Um, they also have experience in overlapping in serving in concentration camps before they get to Yanovska. So four of them overlap in Bialopodaska, where they helped to build that camp. Um, and then we have other examples like this in, in Yakhtarov here, where Paul Fox worked uh, before he got to Yanovska. And then we have um, the, the sort of one of the one of the survivors of the camp. Um, refers to Yanovska as a university of criminals. And that's his word. Um, and another survivor um, says that it was the worst camp that she'd been in and she'd been in Auschwitz and other places. Um, but there is an element of this where you have SS men in Yanovska who then are sent out into district Galician to take over their own camps and ghettos. Um, and often they return to the camp afterwards. And one of the most egregious examples of this and an example that I think is really important um, in understanding, you know, um, in understanding sort of what the impact of these relationships might be, is that these places where the UNOSCA assessment are serving when they leave the camp are not particularly far away. And so the connections remain between them. So Kolonko, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, he goes on to serve um, as the commandant of a very, very small uh, ghetto slash work camp in Grodek Jagolonski. Um, but when, that, when, it times, when it comes time for that camp to be liquidated, uh, the group of men that come to assist him in the murdering of those Jews are all of his former comrades from the Inovska camp. And of course, after the war, they're all lying about whether or not they were there or not. But we know that at least, um, let's see, I'm counting, at least six of them were there. Um, and, and these relationships, you know, continue. Um, why and that's not the only example. Sorry, you have one minute. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I, I can go ahead and um, I go ahead and, and, and finish up here uh, with some of the thoughts and conclusions. Um, and these are perhaps areas for questions as well. You know, one of which is what is the impact of these prior relationships? Um, does familiarity breed a more efficient sort of process um, does it make the camp more brutal? This is one of my questions because uh, I found that Yanovska just, at least to me, seems to be just an incredibly violent and brutal place, even for someone like me who's, who studies this. Um, you know, what is, what is the learned behavior being passed back and forth? One of the things that I've noticed, for example, is that there's very, some very specific perpetrator behaviors that seem to be transmitted back and forth between Yanovska and these other places. And I can talk about those, you know, in the in the questions. Uh, what are the working relationships between these men? Um, and, and are things made easier, um, made more fluid because they simply know each other better? And then lastly, one element that I really want to look at perhaps in the future is how do these relationships during the war impact their post-war sort of um, relationships? And because there are some, and that seems to me to be the most murky element in many ways of perpetrator research at the moment is, is what are these networks after the war? Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, thanks so much. And I look forward uh, to your questions. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation and the very innovative approach. And I see we already have a lot of questions. 
So I would like to introduce to you now our dear colleague, Jan Buzlaff, who is a postdoc candidate at uh, Harvard University, and he will lead the discussion. All right, I'm muting myself. Thank you very much, Daniela. And of course, uh, thank you very much, first and foremost, to uh, both Yuri and Wegman for presenting your fascinating and innovative research. Uh, that is the least one could say after this uh, fascinating hour. Um, so what I would like to do in the next 10 minutes or so uh, is to ask one or two questions, um, two of the many questions that uh, are coming up after these two uh, presentations. And then we will open the Zoom floor uh, for the audience. Um, taking one step back, interestingly, and as Daniela mentioned from the outset, both of you have published in Holocaust and Genocide Studies recently, uh, which attests, I think, first to the journal's vitality and second to the importance of Eastern Europe as the geographical focus of much Holocaust research, research these days. Um, both of your talks also point to, I would say, the fluidity of movements, the fast-paced timelines of the persecution at various spatial levels, and the complexity on the ground. Um, my first question would go to Yuri, um, who started us off, uh, who generously also shared his forthcoming paper with me. So I was wondering, maybe you could just expand a little bit on your findings on a broader level, um, on the role of ethnicity, something that I picked up, uh, both for these Ukrainians. Uh, I also noted that uh, you mentioned that many Jews who escaped the Ustasa camps pretended to be Croats, Serbs, uh, in short, adapted to different ethnicity. Um, so how did your research evolve in different geographical context than the, I would say, the original Ukrainian speaking lands? Um, and tell us a little bit more about your research uh, at the moment. Thank you for your question. To uh, be honest, I'm a specialist on history of uh, Balkans. It was like experiment for me. And you see uh, who, who spoke today, we try to spoke mostly about Eastern Europe, but uh, my subject of my presentation is about Southern Eastern Europe, Southern, let's say Balkans and Southern, yeah, yeah, so on. So for me, it was quite new experience. Uh, first of all, of knowledge of uh, languages because I had to learn a little bit uh, how to uh, read in uh, Serbo-Croatian or Croatian or Serbian, it's political question. It's what is it, <laughs> Bosnian language and so on. And for me, it was a challenge a little bit. Uh, and I must say that a uh, majority of my research was done from uh, sources was analyzed from side of uh, Ukraine nationalist side. You know, uh, I think I'm not sure that I will continue, you know, to dig up uh, this research, you know, more, uh, let's say, from perspective of Balkans archive and so on. But <clears throat> it will be also like 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 part of uh, because I'm writing a book, uh, let's say, or collection of articles about own M activities. It's I, uh, yeah. It's, I hope so, because I didn't catch up your, your question. What was exactly about my research or about this? I, okay, thank you. <laughs> about, about your research, very broadly speaking, what are you working on right now? And what, what are the, the trends? Well, two, 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 two sentences I want to add, you know, that uh, I'm writing mostly about activity of OM during the war in um, all Europe in general. So because of this uh, organization, also had its its own uh, uh, let's say divisions in, in, in Nazi Germany, in Austria, and also in uh, Finland, and so on and so on. It's and their activities, their cooperation with Axis powers, they option, they uh, let's say when they try to create a partisan movement also in Ukraine because it also big question how it was established and. Uh, because you know, Bandarites created their own part of partisan independent uh, detachment and own them, tried to do it for a few months. So, uh, but the most focus is participation in, in um, extermination of Jews, of the Jews, of Poles, and also in collaboration with Nazi Jew. All right, thank you very much. Um, and 
I the same question would go to to you, dear white man. Uh, first of all, all Americans among us will understand the reference. Thank you uh, for your service, first of all. Um, and I thought your talk really makes a powerful case for not only the social network approach in Holocaust research, uh, impressively documented than what the visuals that we saw, but more broadly speaking for Nazi camps beyond any you know, one-sided prototype or even not one single function. Um, it made me think as I was listening to uh, a recent book on uh, It's Pizza by Stefan Hensien uh, in 2018, uh, but unlike those transit ghettos in the general, general government, um, Yanovska seems to uh, have quite a, a variety of sources. So I was wondering, could you tell us a little more about the book? I think everybody is uh, uh, really eager to learn more. Um, and what sources have you gathered? And what is this spatial turn really adding? And then I think you made a really powerful case for the social networks of perpetrators. So uh, mm -hmm. if you could tell us more, that would be lovely. Yeah, thanks. Um, gosh, so um, the book, it, one of the things that I, well, back up, Yanovskas came to me because I, I'd finished my, my, my second book and I was looking for a topic and I did what hopefully we all do is I, I come across things in archives and I'd written them down, you know, maybe this is worth looking at later, I don't know. And the thing that I'd written down was this German army motor pool unit. Um, which was kind of interesting. It was in Lviv and it was a maintenance unit. And I thought, oh, look at this. It turns out that it's not really that interesting, but it used prisoners from Yanovska. And I really hadn't known that much about Yanovska um, before that, honestly. And one of the things that I found so surprising was that there is really no scholarly monograph on it. Thomas Sankuler has done amazing work on it. Dieter Pohl has talked about it. Um, uh, it, it's appears, it appears in sort of, as a, as a cameo in, in lots of different places, but it hasn't had sort of a focused um, study of it. And this isn't because I'm brilliant. It just hasn't, it hasn't been done yet, which is kind of surprising because it has so many sources about it. Um, there are so many survivors uh, actually from this place. Simon Wiesenthal was there, um, you know, uh, Leon Wells, uh, uh, who was sort of a, a, to me, he's a celebrity survivor because I have his testimonies beginning in 1944 to the Soviet Extraordinary State Commission all the way through Eichmann, uh, through the, the post-war German trials into the VHA and the, the Shoah Foundation stuff. There are a number of um, really important memoirs. Um, Rabbi David Kahane, and I see there's a um, Eduardo Kahane here. I, I hope you're a relative, uh, it's amazing, in the audience. Uh, you know, he wrote a memoir, Wells wrote a memoir, um, Wiesenthal talks about it. So there are a lot of sources just, just on the memoir side. Um, and hasn't really had sort of the scholarly approach. What's interesting is that there aren't a whole lot of German wartime sources about it. Um, most of the extant records of the camp didn't survive. Um, so in, in, that, in that sense, the source base really becomes the trials, um, mm -hmm. which are actually really useful uh, because the, the, the Lemberg process um, in Stuttgart is actually the second largest post-war Nazi German trial after the, the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial. Um, and it, it created over 10,000 pages of documents to include a full transcript, which is not something that's normally done. Um, so there's that. Um, as far as spatial stuff though, there's also um, the aerial photographs, which are amazing uh, because they actually cover the camp when it's still in operation before, um, before the, uh, the camp is liberated in July of 1944. Um, I have, I'm working on a separate article about a series of sketches done by a survivor named Zev Porath. And Zev was an architect and he was employed in the camp uh, technical office. And he draws these architectural sketches of the camp while it was in operation while he was there. He then escapes with his drawings. Um, there's a ton of survivor testimony um, in all kinds of different forms from Yishka books to Shoah Foundation to, um, transcribed and translated court documents. Um, and so the court documents from this trial make me look a lot smarter than I am because they have certified translations. So I'm able to access survivor testimony in Yiddish, Hebrew, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, um, Spanish even, uh, because they've been sort of certified as, as translation. So there's really a ton of, I even have um, architectural plans of one of the camps that did survive 
uh, from the DAW that survives. So there's a lot of stuff there. Um, and so I think it's really interesting. And I can talk a lot more about the spatial aspects as well. Uh, the social network is only part of it. I've just applied for, and I'm in the finals, finalist stages of a major grant here in the UK that I hope I get, which will allow me to create a 3D model of the camp uh, based on the photographs, the architectural plans, the aerial photographs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I can talk about that later, but I don't want to monopolize question time, so I'll stop. All right, well, looking forward to hearing more. Uh, we have a question from our own Daniela for Yuri. Uh, was the collaboration rather a symbolic enterprise rather than a real political project? And how did the Germans and Italians react to these approximation, approximations? Do you mean collaboration of O&M uh, with uh, Ustasha? What, what exactly do you mean? Actually not from me, someone sent it to me privately. Ah. So this person wants to clarify, uh, they can unmute themselves. Okay, uh, I'll try to answer. Um, for Owen M, uh, it was you know, uh, one option to have a real ally and this system of fascist Europe, because if we speak about fascist system, different fascist parties, groups, and so on and so on, it doesn't say that all these fascists are friends. You know, it uh, could be conflict between fascist parties, could be conflicts between communist parties. You can, uh, you know, situation when it was war, short war between China and uh, Vietnam, 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 and Soviet Union conflict in 1936. So in this system, uh, to own M, Germany was not loyal, it was enemy. It was enemy, but anyway, own M tried to collaborate, tried to save you know, any sort of connection or relation to, with Germans until 1945. And, and uh, Ustasha was real friend of own M and this fascist system of Europe, if you can imagine this beautiful system. Yes, 1930, 40 years. <laughs> so uh, question of Italy, it's also qu quite interesting question. Because Italian occupational regime uh, in territory of Endeha was loyal to um, Chetniks, and uh, Chetniks were loyal sometimes to to to, to this uh, um, Italian army as well. Ch uh, Italian army didn't want to have any conflict uh, with Chetniks, and sometimes they tried to cooperate also with Tito partisans. For uh, they, you know, they, uh, Italians were, uh, you see, shocked by this terrible system of extermination of people, terrible way uh, of uh, Ustasha in 1941. They were shocked. For them, it was something undescribable. So for Italians, Italians were quite loyal also to Ukrainians, but who cares? Who cares? Because uh, I think last last two sentences that even um, even Ustasha they uh, have to say have some fear that Germany one day also will eat Croatia, and for for uh, Croatian fascists, creation of Ukrainian fascist state. Uh, I must to underline that I am not against Ukrainian statehood or, or Croatian statehood because uh, Ustasha and the UNAM, it's, it's radical groups. In general, it also exists more, uh, not, not radical nationalism as well. So uh, for Ustasha, creation of pro-fascist, fascist Ukrainian state in Eastern Europe, it was a you know, hope that uh, in this fascist Europe, Germany and Italy, they will not eat, <laughs> you know, they will not exterminate uh, Croatia in the future. That's it. All right, thank you very much. And I think we have time for one more question for white man, and maybe we can bundle a couple in the chat together, uh, mostly about the benefits of such a network chart. Boaz uh, is asking, for example, uh, if we did such a network chart for the apparatus of the final solution, do you think it might or it will explain better Eichmann's role in the final solution? And Bundled together with that is the benefits of uh, studying the victims as well, and if maybe those network charge intersect at some point. And that is a question from uh, Sarah Otsatsky-Lazar and, and Natalia. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I, I'm reading the questions in the chat and and uh, one of my sort of roles, I think, is, is to serve as a, as, a, um, as a prophet of digital humanities. And, and if this inspires others in this, in our group and, and in, our, in our discipline to sort of start employing these things, um, I think you really should. And so the first thing I wanna to say to everyone is that you do not need to be a tech wizard to do this. If you can take notes, you can do this. Um, and as I, as I said, you know, it, it's not difficult and you all do this anyway. Um, so to answer some of the questions, um, number one, with regard to Eichmann, again, you can do a social network analysis of any kind of thing. So for example, this is, a, I'm gonna to get to Boaz's question because I think you can. One of the things that I started doing um, earlier was taking Himmler's appointment book and building a social network analysis slash map of the book. In other words, who is he meeting with? When is he meeting with them? Where is he meeting with them? And then coding, what is the nature of the meeting, right? Um, and you know, I'm not done with that because that's a massive endeavor. Um, but you can imagine, particularly when we think about whether or not um, orders and decisions about the final solution are transmitted orally, how building that kind of a network might actually show us those unwritten communications because we already know um, for example, from Chris's work uh, on the origin to find the solution, that by looking at Himmler's visits to the Eastern Front and then mapping onto that, how the killings change after he visits individual groups in terms of, you know, moving to killing uh, all Jews regardless of, of age or gender, that we can start to get a sense that the decision must have been made, right? Imagine if we do that um, by, for example, seeing who meets with Himmler or what the correspondence looks like so who is Eichmann talking with? Even if we don't know what the conversations are, um, what if all of a sudden he's talking to one person in great detail, so that edge increases? So we can see, wow, that relationship just got really intense. Why is that? Um, you know, because I think that because we sometimes don't have the smoking gun document, we have to look at indirect and inferential ways of, of learning about sort of these kinds of decisions, right? Um, and so I think that's one of the things of that's really beneficial of looking at it from a social network perspective is you get lots of really suggestive um, findings that you can then sort of pull that string a little bit and see if it makes sense, right? See if it's feasible or reasonable. Um, some of the other comments absolutely regarding survivors um, as well as, you know, victims or, or, or prisoners in the camp, you know, these networks um, definitely can be, create, can be recreated. And again, you can do that at any kind of scale. You can even just look at a scale in the sense of where in the camp are people working or where are they interacting, right? Uh, where are they assigned over time, right? And so um, there's a really great graduate student here, uh, Chad Gibbs, who actually just finished and, and got a job. So congratulations on that. And he's actually working on a, on a social network of uh, Treblinka survivors and those involved in the resistance in the camp. So, you know, I think this is something that, that absolutely could and should be applied to um, to all sides, right? It is, this is, does not need to be uh, a perpetrator focused um, approach. From my perspective, it, it's, it just was easier that way because I have a lot more documentation, at least during the war of where the SS guys are versus the survivors. Um, however, you know, I can just speak anecdotally. I have compiled lots of information about the survivors in the sense of, for example, where they're testifying. Um, you know, after the war. And you can actually draw some pretty interesting conclusions just about that kind of a network and where they're moving. Um, but I think that it's absolutely something that can be done. And it's something that, you know, I'm here sort of to show the proof of the concept, I think, and hope that others will take up those particular elements. Um, because we know that even, even in terms of post-memory and post-war stuff, you know, where do survivors settle? Um, and, and how is that related to where they come from? You know, and do they stay there? You know, I mean, there, there are all kinds of things that, again, you know, that we don't, we can't even begin to understand what the questions might be in a lot of cases until we start taking these phone books full of information and begin visualizing them. So we can start to say, ooh, why is that group of people in Toronto? You know, or, or why did all the survivors from Lviv settle in, you know, Georgia? That's not true, of course. But, you know, like, 
what, what is what is this, you know, what are these things about? Just like when I was doing the perpetrators and I was thinking, well, how come, wow, all of a sudden they all went through Lublin or, or you know, they, there are so many of them from Yugoslavia. What, what is this about? You know, and again, I think the suggestive element comes with things like, you know, Adolf Kalanko stood outside of Fritz Katzmann's door for a year as his personal sentry. Like, what does that mean? What does that mean for our understanding of the Holocaust? Right. And that's a connection that I never in a thousand years would have drawn unless I had done this work of mapping this out. But now when you think about it, of course they had to know each other. I mean, this is the guy you see, good morning, sir, every morning when walking in. Right. And so I think it raises questions that, that we can't really see. Um, and I hope that answered some of the questions, but my, my answer to a lot of this about, you know, can we use it in other groups is absolutely right. And, and you, can, you can code this into your, into your network so that survivors are, are, or, or victims, however you want to look at it, are a certain color, right? Um, and you can start to see then even patterns so that you can have this mixed network of survivors, perpetrators, you know, different ethnic groups, however you want to look at it, right? Um, so, I mean, again, you know, and I'm happy to talk to anybody, uh, you know, offline or later who wants to talk about getting into this and how they can use this in their work as well. Oh, I'm sure many people will be very engaged and, uh, and, and in touch. That's really uh, fascinating. I think we can squeeze one more little question uh, from Natalia, um, who asked Yuri, would you agree that the Ustasa revival of Croat statehood served as a model for the OEN to create an ethnical purified nation state? I also wonder whether so-called the Rusinian question played any role in ustasha melnag relations, if at all. Thank you. Okay, uh, so Natalia, thank you for your question. I will speak less. I, I, I trust, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, yes, uh, it was an example, the Mashal, you know, example how Owen M tried to you know, imagine their own state. And if you read this press and, and other sources, it was quite good example. We, can, we cannot, of course, we cannot you know, imagine how it would be in you know, the state if it would be created in 1941 and so on, but yes. The second question regarding to a Russian question, um, I don't know. I know that this question of Russian identity uh, was more, uh, more uh, let's say, active in, in Transcarpathia. And mm -hmm. in Transcarpathia and Ukraine, in part of Slovakia as well, where a lot of people with Ukrainian and Russian identity, uh, own M and active, own activists were quite critical. And they blame, for instance, Slovakian government that it's, uh, they support Russians and so on. But I think this question was not what's very popular in the, in the heart during the war. Russian question. All right. Well, that was, thank you very much for such a, a fast response. Um, as tradition wants, I will turn over the floor for the final words to uh, the, the head of the program, uh, Dr. Boris Cohen. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for two fascinating uh, presentations. I think we are all getting wiser with every, uh, every event we are doing. And this is actually what uh, our, uh, our being is about, learning, teaching, learning new things all the time, sitting on the edge. So I think uh, this is really uh, was a very, really uplifting uh, event uh, again. So thank you very much. I would uh, like to uh, say two things about future events, and then I will uh, uh, give some insights uh, which I'll talk about. First, uh, on May, we are not staging our own events. We're doing an event with Get the Fight of House. Boz, I'm sorry. We can't really hear you. There oh. is a problem. OK, I'm trying again. Now can you hear me? Uh, OK, try. Yes. Maybe it means I shouldn't talk too much, but uh, uh, we are having a, an international conference on uh, marking 25th anniversary of Yad Layeret of the Children's Museum of Ghetto Fighters House. It will be about the Jewish child during and after the Holocaust, research and pedagogy in the changing world. It's on May 3, and it will have all uh, several presentations dealing 
with all of its education, and it was a very interesting round fun uh, table with uh, people from all sorts of institutions all over the world, including some who are here. And we will have a panel on the, the Jewish child in the Holocaust in perspectives in research with uh, Verena Bulter and uh, Joanna Mission. So we are really, uh, it's really something to look forward to, and we'll also uh, uh, send the notification on this, although uh, the, the, the organizing and the group is done by Get the Fighters. Uh, we are also take, still taking a, a proposal for a course of papers for, for a Barbarossa conference between War and Mass Murder, eight years to Barbarossa, on the 22nd and 24th of June. So uh, there is still time to send in your, uh, your uh, proposals. Uh, one of the things uh, that we are talking a lot about in the Western Academy is something like what Rayton uh, is doing, has done, and your book is in our library, uh, about uh, the connection between the war and the mass murder. And uh, this is what we will talk about in the conference. So uh, 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 encouraging all of you to propose. We are doing it in a staggered way, two days, but uh, two days between each of them, uh, not something uh, very uh, too oppressive. And we already have a, a, a keynote speaker, which is uh, Professor Gerhard Weinberg. So uh, uh, send your proposal so we can uh, build the, the program soon. We send until the 14th of uh, April, you can send in the proposal. Uh, one last thing I would like to say is uh, international cooperation. We are, uh, and we've done all sorts of cooperations in the last uh, year. The corona time, I've been asked to reflect about this for an interview to Israeli computing magazine, a computer magazine, and uh, we actually uh, uh, forged a lot of new networks uh, because of the the, the the dire situation of the COVID-19, uh, we have now uh, two uh, uh, online for now cooperations with the German students, our students with German students. We have a, an international course of innovation and uh, entrepreneurship in, uh, for Holocaust memory, where we have students from uh, China, India, Switzerland, Austria, whatever, all over the globe, uh, people who are uh, studying how to build a, a Holocaust memory startup. And today we had the first speech and people were presenting amazing projects. Uh, so this is, has come to be through uh, the, the special circumstances of the time. We are going to next year to start teaching a Holocaust courses in the American University uh, online. And uh, we are really open for any sort of cooperation, any new idea, anything that can tie uh, researchers together, uh, students together, everything like this is blessed. So uh, thank you very much for being here. And uh, uh, thank you for the speakers again, and of course the organizing team and Daniela and Jan who are here, and uh, we can say Mazal to Juan Michel who gave birth to a boy, girl. Uh, that gave birth, so she's not with us today, but we are uh, really happy for her and thankful to all of you. Thank you very much, thank you all, and uh, goodbye. Thanks so much, Boaz. Appreciate it. Thank awesome. you for being as well. And, and Jan, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.